as we think about transit, transit has the capacity to kind of undo some of those historic wrongs, some of the decisions that were made to only provide certain services or to put in a highway infrastructure to, to divide communities of color from other communities. I mean, I think about, you know, I-35 I- uh, through downtown Austin. I remember being in Austin, Texas, and just it, they deliberately put in that highway to separate the black community from downtown Austin. You know, and one of the ways that we could actually kind of help to rectify some of those uh, past to a very poor decisions that have led to our current inequities is to think about transit as a way to kind of ameliorate that, to actually provide transit that actually helps to kind of bridge some of those physical separations that poor planning in the past has uh, have exacerbated some of the discrimination and uh, systemic racism in our uh, communities. Our guests this morning are Dr. Tracy Corley, Mass Inc.'s Transit-Oriented Development Fellow and the author of From Transactional to Transformative, The Case for Equity in Gateway City Transit-Oriented Development. And joining us from Denver this morning, good morning, Susan Wood, co-author of the American Planning Association's Planning for Equity Policy Guide. And she serves as a planning project manager with the Regional Transportation District in Denver. So welcome to you both. Thank you. Uh, Tracy, let's begin by talking about your report, basically, that examined uh, transit-oriented development. And let's talk about what that is specifically, and here in Massachusetts, what it means for gateway cities. Yes, Bob. Thanks very much uh, for just opening all of this up and also hosting this today. Um, Just so that uh, folks know, uh, in case you're not familiar, a gateway city is here in Massachusetts is a what a lot of other places call a legacy city. They're typically former industrial regions or or former industrial cities that uh, thanks to deindustrialization of the 70s and 80s have found themselves in a place where they're trying to figure out how to reinvent themselves, how to rebuild. And here in Massachusetts, there are actually uh, 26 uh, gateway cities that are actually uh, defined by the legislature as gateway cities based upon certain demographics and characteristics. And of course, you know, for those of you who might not be familiar, transit-oriented development are those districts uh, surrounding uh, uh, rail or other high capacity or multimodal transit hubs. Uh, typically, that's about a half a mile from where the transit station is located. And we oftentimes talk about those areas as uh, um, uh, uh, that uh, district boundary as that 10 or 15 minute walk from the transit station uh, to kind of create those walkable districts and walkable neighborhoods. And so, yeah. Go ahead. And, and uh, Susan, out in Denver, do you have something comparable to gateway cities and TOD, transit-oriented development. Yes, we certainly have development around our station areas, around our rail lines, and also development that we believe will be coming around our bus rapid transit lines as well. Um, A little different because the West is so much newer than the East. And um, instead of areas um, having existed for a long time uh, with with people who who live in those station areas, um, it's more that some of them are brand new. And, uh, but certainly we do have much the same thing in the sense that uh, we have development around our station areas or transit oriented development. Uh, Tracy, what has been the history of transit oriented development around our gateway cities? Well, it's pretty interesting that uh, with our gateway cities, um, a lot of them have uh, commuter rail stops. And as we know here in Massachusetts, the MBTA manages the commuter rail network. And when that system was set up back in the fifties or so, those station areas were set up to help shuttle people into jobs into downtown Boston. And so as a result, a lot of those station areas uh, tend to have a lot of parking capacity around them or they were empty lots. And they were actually some of the least desirable properties uh, to actually uh, live mm-hmm. and to actually create communities because you know people were coming in from surrounding areas, dropping off their cars and hopping on the train. Well, you know, as we kind of looked at other regions around the world in particular, but also other regions around the United States, folks are starting to realize that, you know, we can't just keep adding cars to our highways forever. And we're already feeling the pinch, you know, with the amount of traffic congestion we have here in Metro Boston. And so um, with that realization, it's like, well, we can actually do a lot of uh, development around our transit, our, our, 
our rail stations to help create more compact, dense, walkable communities so that folks can actually have most of what they need within a 15 minute walk from home, but then hop onto the train if they need to get around the region or get uh, into Boston or to other uh, larger metropolitan areas. Um, but, you know, we're hoping that we, we can do more than just shuttle people back and forth into Boston. We want to actually improve connectivity amongst our gateway cities and treat them as regional hubs across the Commonwealth. Susan, has it been uh, similar in Denver where uh, what kind of development has occurred around transit hubs there? You know, I, what's most often promoted is mixed use development where it's a combination of residential development as well as office and potentially uh, some, uh, some retail and, and other uses um, as well. Um, I, I think that that has been the goal. Um, in, in some cases, the residential the development that has, has occurred has tended to be very high end. Uh, development uh, with the properties actually being very valued high and, and very expensive. Um, and, and I think actually in Denver, that's our challenge is, um, is to have properties that are affordable and develop um, residential communities around transit oriented development where everybody has an opportunity to live. I think yeah. Tracy would agree that's the same situation here. It's similar. I would say it's, it's very much the same in Boston. I think one of the things to keep in mind with this report is that the reason why we focus specifically on gateway cities in this report is because what's happening in our gateway cities isn't necessarily what's happening in Boston. Because the markets are much weaker in our gateway cities, as well as uh, uh, each of our gateway cities is very different. You know, there's, I mean, you can't really talk about them all as if the same thing were happening in each and every single one of them. Um, but one of the things we do find is that, you know, whenever we looked at four key areas, we looked at demographic change, we looked at socioeconomic exclusion, we looked at uh, gentrification fears, and we also looked at geographic disparities. We find that it plays out very differently. And so in our gateway cities, you have, um, uh, residential development that's happening of where market rate development is helping to improve the markets there is helping to also bring in people from other communities to kind of uh, bring more disposable income to our gateway cities which is the reason why we have some state level programs that are designed to actually put in place market rate housing but we also have a number of communities who are putting in uh, comparatively a lot of affordable housing both subsidized affordable as well as naturally affordable housing thanks to a number of really great programs uh, that both uh, state level programs as as well as private sector programs from organizations like uh, uh, the Healthy Neighborhoods uh, Equity Fund and uh, also uh, LISC's uh, Equitable yeah. Transit Oriented Development Accelerator Fund. And so they're helping to kind of build housing that's both subsidized as well as uh, naturally affordable in our gateway cities where the markets are just much, much different than in Boston. Uh, but we're seeing less mixed use development, which we want to see more of because we want to have our gateway cities not be bedroom communities, but actually be vibrant neighborhoods where people can actually have access to basic services right there in their neighborhoods. Because right now, a lot of people don't have grocery stores, for example, that they can get to without a car. And when you have communities Communities where 25% or more of the population don't have access to a car, it makes it very hard to get access to healthy foods, to get access to just to basic services. And that's a lot of what we talk about in our report. Well, that's, that ties into our second poll question, uh, if we can put that up on the screen for people. Do you need to leave your neighborhood to get access to essential services like grocery stores and pharmacies? and uh, give us your answers, yes, no, or not sure. I'd like to see what you and the audience have been experiencing in terms of that access. Um, I know that one of the problems we've had here in Massachusetts when we do develop transit hubs, and I know this is the case in Framingham, uh, there's a lack of parking for commuter rail. And what happens is that uh, more parking facilities are either built or needed how do you cope with the increased need for parking as you're trying to get more people to take the train? Well, you know, I, one of the things we talk very frequently about is, you know, we want people to not drive to the commuter rail stations. We want to make sure that the uh, last mile transit solutions are there so that people have reliable, frequent bus shuttle services. They can use their bike paths, they can use the sidewalks, and also that they're living closer to the train station areas so that they really don't have to drive. And so I think that we have to be very conscious of, yes, the fact is that right now in our gateway cities, they are very car dependent. 
I think that uh, we've seen that uh, the RTAs are doing what they can with what resources that they have, but we would like to see our regional transit authorities have uh, more resources to be able to provide more reliable, frequent, all-day services. Uh, for example, some of our RTAs don't have service available on the weekends at all. And so if you're someone working at an area hospital and you typically take the bus because you're in a, a middle, mid, middle or low-wage job, um, then all of a sudden you have to find a ride to get to work on the weekends. You know, so we want to make sure that we are providing, you know, other alternatives to actually getting to the car because that property around the, uh, uh, the rail station can become vibrant mixed use places. Now that said, you know, we already have a lot of parking in a lot of communities around those rail stations. Uh, we can actually do a better job of actually how we actually leverage that parking, how it's actually designed. So instead of having, you know, just an open surface lot, you know, what can we be doing to kind of put in a structure that combines parking with retail space, with residential space? There's an opportunity to kind of do more development around and above the station area itself to actually make it a little bit more vibrant. Uh, we do have the results from our poll about leaving your neighborhood to get access to essential services. 38% of you said, yes, you do need to leave your neighborhood. 62% said no. We want to thank you for uh, responding to that. Uh, how about uh, out in Denver, Susan, uh, in terms of uh, parking and dealing with cars to get people to mass transit services? Well, definitely our, our rail lines, which within the city itself are primarily light rail lines. We do have a commuter rail line that goes to the airport, but uh, primarily those lines go to downtown Denver. We're a hub and spoke system, but uh, we serve a lot of sur suburban communities, um, similar to what Tracy described. And because of that, there is a lot of parking at, at a number of the stations, but there's also a real intent to, um, to, not have so much parking, to, to also incentivize using uh, transit. And as some developments have come in, or areas that happen to go through older neighborhoods, as they have started to, um, to change, uh, the development community has definitely recognized that um, parking is somewhat, one, from, from a developer point of view, it's somewhat wasted space. And, uh, and also from a transit point of view, um, it, it doesn't necessarily maximize uh, the area around the station. So the thought is to do shared parking, and there's a number of shared parking agreements that have been put in place so that there are, and most of these are structured parking, as Tracy also described, um, so that there are folks can park there and, and take the train into downtown, but hopefully um, it'll also serve the area around the station for those using that station area or living in that area. Uh, Tracy, another question. Uh, what about the role of planning and, and achieving equity in transit-oriented development? In other words, when we talk about doing development that's equitable, what are we talking about and, and how can planning help us get there? Well, you know, in this report, you know, we took a look at uh, three areas of equity, uh, which doesn't in any way cover all of the real issues that we really need to address. You know, we talk a lot about um, uh, the different ways in which kind of what's happening today in our current environment, you know, we're seeing people who are really protesting a lot of these disparities, the systemic and structural racism from things like uh, redlining and siting of where highways and transit systems are placed and wh whether or not communities have access to parks. And there are a lot of other decisions that have been made that have been historically excluding sp specific communities, uh, typically targeting immigrant communities and uh, communities of color and especially black uh, communities here in the United States, uh, but especially, uh, but also here in the Commonwealth. And so, you know, whenever we look at um, kind of what our, the composition of our gateway cities look like, if we look at what the demographic change, we see that, you know, over the past 10, 20 years, our, our gateway cities have become more and more diverse as a lot of the immigrants, as well as people moving from other parts of the country and looking for affordable places to live, have been flocking to our gateway cities and those folks who've been coming most recently have been people of color rather than people coming from maybe uh, historically European countries and where they can more uh, quickly assimilate and kind of uh, uh, integrate as white members of our society. And so what we're seeing is that, you know, there are a lot of areas where we need to address equity and disparities in our communities. And we picked, uh, we picked three areas to kind of consider for pillars of where equity should be focused. 
one of which is on integrative land use, which is also includes housing. Um, the second of which is equitable transportation. Of course, we want to make sure that people have many options for getting around their communities and getting to the places that they need to go. And then we also take a look at inclusive economic development. And these three pillars, they're very closely connected. They're very intertwined. And we need to be very careful that whenever we're doing planning, that we're not planning those three areas in silos, that we're actually planning them together. And so one of the things we do is that we wrap up this report uh, by making a recommendation to bring these three pillars together and remove silos through what we call a joint local planning. And so this re recommendation takes traditional planning processes which tend to think about geographies like a district or a city or a region and then start to think about the community and how making sure that the community is an integral part of whatever ge geography you're planning for. And so one of the key things about including, you know, the people who actually currently live in your communities and making sure that you ha have a very representative group of people who are involved from the start throughout the planning process, not just providing input that then a select group of people goes into a black box to kind of create a solution for a community, but throughout the entire process, it, communities can help transcend on some of those geographic boundaries and also cross many of the racial, cultural, and political lines that are currently dividing us today. They also make uh, planning more integral to development when it inc includes the existing populations and residents so that uh, they are a part of the process of envisioning what growth and stabilization of their uh, neighborhoods look like. And we also recommend for our gateway cities because of limited resources that um, transit-oriented development districts can help channel resources as opposed to figure, focusing on you know, citywide master plans, focusing on transit-oriented districts and other districts and how to connect those up. You can actually channel resources and create nodes that leverage our existing infrastructure, especially rail infrastructure across the Commonwealth while integrating the community. And Susan, your specialty being planning, uh, one of our Guest Todd asks, beside ex exclusion or inclusionary zoning, what tools are there to ensure that low-income people won't be displaced by transit-oriented development? Yeah, I, I really think the answer to that is, is it's multi multiple answers to that. But one in particular that covers it all is being intentional from the beginning. It's recognizing that, that the potential for displacement exists and that if nothing is put in place before the market forces come into play, that it's likely to happen. Um, once the area, uh, the land value goes up, it's very hard um, if you haven't planned for that occurrence to put that genie back in the bottle. So from a planning perspective, um, the first place to begin that is each community plans for its future and to start with the comprehensive plan or master plan, which is always a public process uh, where uh, community members weigh in about what they want to see for their community to start there and start to put that vision and goal in place that, uh, that in in inclusive housing will be uh, important and inclusive community is important and that displacement is something that's, that's, that's not desirable. And then beyond that, which it goes beyond planning in many cases, is looking at those financial opportunities like land banking. Tracy mentioned a number of, uh, of uh, entities that work in this um, to preserve that property and to keep it affordable. Yeah, and let me also jump in just to say, uh, one of the things is that right now, I think we have very few tools for really kind of preventing people from getting displaced. And I think part of that comes from the fact that we do tend to focus on the market first and we don't really prioritize the people. And so, you know, we really need to make sure that we prioritize keeping people in their homes and in their neighborhoods. So I think that, you know, we have a bad habit of thinking, oh, well, you know, we can just move the poor around, you know, you know, you can just go yeah. to this neighborhood or you can go to, but, you know, whenever you do that, you're breaking up social cohesion, you're breaking up uh, community networks, you're breaking up Absolutely. support networks. And so it's very hard to get ahead where you're constantly being shuffled around. And so I think that that's something that we need to kind of rethink just in all of our policies is how do we put people first and think about the needs of the people before we think about the markets. Yeah, I, I did a story in Brockton where there are a lot of people displaced from Roxbury and Mattapan who ended up in Brockton and were trying to get back into the city. And they did have a lower cost option beside commuter rail. They could take a bus that would take them to the red line, I believe, in Braintree, and they could take the red line in. But they had to fashion this themselves or else they could not afford the cost of commuter rail just to get back home. And I think this has happened in Randolph. I think it's happened in a lot of other communities where people have been displaced 
and it's uh, very difficult for them to work their way back. So at least in Brockton, they did uh, come up with some solution for that. Um, we have, uh, Heather has, has uh, sent a couple of questions in uh, talking about a residential development immediately next to the Ashmont station on the red line. And it's proposed to not include any on-site parking. Uh, she says local residents oppose the development because it will add demand for street parking. She says she recalls hearing that residents of the new building will not be able to get a residential parking permit. She asked if that's legal and is there a tool we can use to encourage households without vehicles to occupy such housing? Question for either one of you. Well, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting uh, that, you know, typically one of the first things that people talk about when you talk about additional development is, oh my gosh, there's going to be a demand for more parking. There are going to be more cars on the streets. Well, not if you do mixed use development. I was in Seattle when the city of Seattle actually eliminated parking requirements and they had high rise buildings going in without parking. And so um, it didn't stop you know, positive development from happening in many places across Seattle because people want to live in places where they don't have to spend half of their lives in their cars. I mean, you know, we of course, you know, we have, you know, more sophisticated, you know, vehicles now with, you know, DVD players and all kinds of entertainment systems, because if you're spending two, three hours a day driving back and forth, you know, that, that then that's the way you're going to kind of design your communities. Well, you know, if you have communities where you are able to walk everywhere, I live in Boston in a community without a car. And I probably rent a car maybe two or three times a year because I really don't need it because I have everything that I need right here and within walking distance. I mean, that's part of the reason why we asked the question, how many times have you left, you know, your community since this pandemic started? I really haven't had to leave here, um, but twice since I've, uh, I mean, and that's only because I need, I wanted to get something from Trader Joe's and there's no Trader Joe's in my neighborhood, you know, but pretty much I have four other grocery stores I can choose from, but I really wanted something from Trader Joe's, you know, and so I think that, you know, we need to really be thinking about that, that if you create good mixed use development where people have access to most of their needs right there in your community, they don't need cars and you won't have that uptick in traffic. As a matter of fact, you'll actually help improve economic development for your community if people are actually walking around and actually using the bodegas, the grocery stores. They're actually uh, getting services right there in their community as opposed to getting in their cars and having to go out to the uh, suburban uh, mall or go out or drive into Boston for entertainment. You know, we can actually have those things right in our local communities. And uh, yeah. Susan, uh, out in Colorado, uh, you know, are, are residences marketed because they have parking or, you know, is that a problem when um, you know, this, this um, unit comes with parking because we assume you're going to be driving your car. You know, I, I don't know so much that, that uh, we're at that point yet where units are marketed because they have parking um, uh, with them. We may well get to that point. Mm -hmm. uh, I do believe that we're in an earlier stage maybe of, of the evolution process here where we do sometimes have issues with um, uh, developing properties that aren't developed with parking or with a reduced parking ratio, and uh, and 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 just a, just as the uh, um, uh, attendee to the to the meeting today said, um, you know, the worry there's worry by residents that people will park on the street and take up all the spaces and it will be um, a problem, and and that definitely has has happened here. I wholeheartedly agree with Tracy mixed use developments where everyone can, where you can access the needs that you have um, without needing to have a car is really the overall solution and, and, and key to that. Um, beyond that though, if you're not quite to that point, <clears throat> as an area develops, if you have shared por parking so that you at least minimize the amount of parking that you're needing to provide, which isn't a good, a good use of space, then, then you sort of, split the difference a little bit and provide some additional parking for those that are living there, um, but, uh, but, but maybe also preserve uh, land for other uses. Yeah, it's a particular challenge in Boston because we're, you know, such an older city, but, uh, you know, people want to use mass transit and they don't, you know, they want to leave their car somewhere near where they can access mass transit and that's a problem. So yeah. even if we make mass transit better, uh, that's going to attract more people and the parking still remains, still remains an issue. Yeah. Um, 
we, we have had a couple of questions about COVID-19 and we really haven't talked about mm -hmm. that, the impact of that on transit and uh, development in general. But Tracy, uh, somebody asked, uh, Kelly asked, how does COVID-19 factor into th these ideas about transforming uh, transit-oriented uh, districts? Well, you know, it's been very interesting to see all of the conversations about um, you know, just to put it pretty bluntly, like almost attacks on density and transit saying, oh, well, this is like the end of d density, uh, dense communities and transit because, you know, nobody's going to want to want to live in uh, places where, you know, the homes are close together or ride transit because of you know, the uh, the potential for, you know, getting infected by a, 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 another pandemic uh, during another epidemic or pandemic. Uh, but we're finding, you know, there's a lot of evidence refuting that. So uh, one of the key things about density is it's not density that's the challenge, it's crowding. And so that has, as we kind of look at the numbers in the communities where uh, the COVID-19 has been most prevalent, it's really in communities where you have more people living per household. And typically that is being driven because of uh, land prices and, and home prices. So we have people who are making extremely low wages who just can't afford to rent a place where you have what you, ex what you expect to have as a standard number of people per housing unit. I mean, we even show in the report that, you know, if you kind of take a look at the demographics and look at the demographics by race and also the number of occupied units by race, you find that people of color tend to have more people per unit living in a household than you have of, of white residents living in our communities. And a lot of that is tied to the cost of housing and also the, uh, the uh, lower home ownership rates. And so uh, whenever you have more people in a household where you don't have enough space, you know, to kind of, number one, distance yourself and also um, a lot of our lower um, uh, lower wage uh, people of color are actually working in essential services. They're working in our grocery stores. They're working in our hospitals. Um, th those are the folks who are more likely to actually uh, ca get COVID-19. But then we also are seeing that, um, unfortunately, here in Massachusetts, we've had a number of transit drivers who have a uh, uh, contracted COVID-19, we're finding in other places, as a matter of fact, there was an article that came out yesterday that showed both in Paris and Tokyo, two of the densest cities um, in the world, they actually have done contact tracing and shown that there have been no COVID-19 clusters connected to transit. And a lot of it has to do with, you know, of, of just the cleaning practices of transit, which we've started to institute here in Massachusetts, but also just differences in lifestyle. I mean, you get on the bus or the train here and everybody's talking on their phones. Well, people in Japan just don't talk on the train. You know, it's pretty quiet. I remember that also in Sweden, uh, being on the train, you know, jam pack rush hour and it's dead silent. I mean, you could hear, you know, people like rustling their papers because it was just so quiet. And I mean, and that makes a, it makes a huge difference in transmission. So I think we need to kind of rethink, you know, the uh, associated dangers with, you know, density and transit. I mean, that they're just, um, I think that if it's done right, if we actually change some of our behaviors and some of our practices, then it will not be an issue. As a matter of fact, when people actually live in communities where they are able to walk to basic services, where they are uh, able to get what they need right there in their communities, when they are, do have a social network close by, close ties to their communities, for the people are there checking in on them, making sure that you're healthy, that you know your neighbors, those are the things that transit-oriented development and more compact dense uh, development can kind of help uh, and whenever we have additional pandemics like this. I mean, you know, we talk a lot about social infrastructure, uh, which is uh, the subject of a book. Um, I, 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 there's actually, it's a reference in our report, um, you know, talking about how like uh, during uh, the massive heat wave uh, that kind of hit the United States a few years ago, the cities and communities where there was good social infrastructure, as well as people had closer ties to their neighbors, you had a much lower death rate than you had in communities where that social infrastructure and those connections weren't there. Let's pull up our uh, third polling question. It's actually two questions in one. Uh, in your neighborhood, are you able to walk to transit from your home? That's the first part of the question. And similarly, do you think that people in low income neighborhoods in your town or city are able to walk to transit from their homes? Why don't you take a, a moment and uh, answer those questions for us? I think one of the impacts of COVID-19, of course, is uh, people aren't as enthusiastic about returning to mass transit if they have the choice to drive. Um, they consider that to be safer. So I know the MBTA is, is anticipating that 
there's going to be low ridership for quite a while. Of course, this puts more strain on our roadways. Uh, Susan, is that a similar impact in, in the wide open spaces of uh, Denver, Colorado? Um, yes, it most definitely is. When the pandemic hit in Denver in March, we saw a drop in uh, ridership by around 70 percent. I mean, it was like falling off off a cliff. And um, and and I don't know that we're actually starting to see it come back yet, because that's true. If people can drive, um, I think they're they're choosing to. But we're still not fully open here at this point in time. So um, people are are trickling back into their into their workspaces, and uh, many people are still working from home. There's a great deal of encouragement to to telework, and in fact, it's been said that the pandemic probably accelerated uh, telecommuting by a decade. Uh, and I think that that, that is likely, uh, likely true. Um, so in some ways as the transit provider, we, we, we certainly have some concerns about our ridership coming back uh, because that is the service that we, that we provide. Um, but we do believe it will come back because it is a necessity. And there's, there's a, a whole group of people who definitely need transit in order to get to their work. And if they can't get to work, they, they don't get paid. And I think this is where the equity issue comes in because the yes. people who don't have the option of driving are often the lower income service workers who have to take the bus and the T. Uh, Tracy, what about that? Yeah, well, you know, it's kind of interesting that our polling has shown that, you know, even though uh, the, uh, amongst the folks who actually responded to our poll, uh, a lot of them are working from home. That's not universally the case. I mean, a lot of folks just don't have the ability to work from home. And so and I think that that has been uh, left out of the conversation as to, you know, kind of exactly what kind of jobs are we prioritizing as we're putting in place some of these both emergency as well as long term policies um, around uh, COVID-19 and how we respond to it. Um, so I, I think that, you yeah, I mean, that is spot on. You know, we need to think about not only those who are transit dependent in terms of those who can't afford to use transit, but there are also a number of people who just can't drive, you know, whether it be because of uh, health concerns that they might have. And also we have a, a rapidly aging population where, you know, we want to make sure that people who uh, are, are that that uh, make sure that our seniors aren't trapped in their homes because they can't get around because they don't have access to reliable transit. And I think that what you're seeing also is, you know, in areas where the transit is not as reliable as in other places. I mean, for a number of us who live like in downtown Boston, um, you know, we have a lot of options. And I have two train lines and a bus, a very heavily trafficked bus line that I can choose from within three minutes of my walking out the door. But that's not the case for a lot of folks across the Commonwealth. And so in places where there aren't options, I mean, you know, or the options are very slim or the bus lines don't match up with the different shifts and the different types of work uh, that are uh, that are had around uh, the community or uh, doesn't really take into consideration the other reasons why people need to get around town because only 15% of travel is uh, because of people needing to get to work. You know, we need to think about holistically about the reasons why people need to get around and as things open back up, people are gonna also be very desperate just to reconnect with friends and family. And if they've been displaced from communities, they're going to want to be able to get back to those communities to, in order to be able to check in on friends and family. And so we need to be th really thinking about those things and making sure that we have options in place so that people don't have to drive. But it's going to take a, lo a lot of commitment and a lot of investment in making sure that we have the kinds of service that people are looking mm -hmm. for. And those people who need mass transit need to get to it. Yeah. And I think that's a really important aspect of, you know, transit oriented development around transit hubs. We do have the results of that poll in your neighborhood. Are you able to walk to transit? from your home, 74% said yes, 26% said no. And do you think that people in low income neighborhoods in your town or city are able to walk to transit from their homes? 55% said yes, 31% said no, 14% not sure. So a fairly large percentage of uh, low income people uh, might have more of a challenge of getting to that mass transit. So that's something to, t to keep in mind when you're planning around these transit areas. Yeah, 
So I know that there are a number of uh, gateway cities that are trying to figure out, you know, how to provide services, especially to both low income people as, to, as well as for people who, like I say, can't drive because of other reasons, you know, how to kind of improve services. I mean, one of the good things is that we do have both from the state as well as from the federal government, a number of programs to help do micro transit, which is to kind of do more flexible route options, you know, in communities. And so our gateway cities are testing those out to kind of see what they can provide. But of course, you know, we need more public input. So, You had a, a question from John about what role regional transit agencies can play in affecting local land use decisions. Well, you know, that kind of, I think, comes back to what we're recommending in the report around joint and local planning, is that it's not just, you know, the planning department of a city or a planning team from a regional uh, a planning commission that's actually doing the planning work. It really is all of the key stakeholders coming to the table with members from the community. And so I think that, you know, if the transit agency is not a part of the planning process and making land use decisions, then it's not a very equitable, inclusive process. Because I think uh, transit agencies have a lot of insight into what riders need in local communities, and they need to be a part of that conversation. You know, very early into uh, uh, working here um, at Mass Inc. and going out and talking to different uh, communities, and I remember having a conversation with one group, it was actually a business group, who were talking about a development they were planning and how frustrated they were with the development that was happening. and they're not being space for the bus to actually get people to those locations. So, you know, making sure, you know, as we think about, you know, the development that we're doing, we talk about mixed use to kind of help uh, uh, take away some of the car traffic. We need to make sure that also we have the infrastructure so that buses can actually get to uh, areas of high development uh, so that if people don't have to drive, people can actually take the bus to get to these uh, development areas or people can ride their bikes and have some place to actually park their bikes. I mean, you know, these are the things that we need to be thinking about holistically and I think our regional transit agencies bring that kind of expertise and need to be at the table in all of our planning conversations. Uh, Susan, out in Colorado, what kind of links do you have between, do you have regional transit authorities, do you have services to bring people to, uh, you know, larger uh, commuter transit hubs? Well, actually, I'd like to tag on a little bit, too, if it's mm -hmm. okay to what Tracy sure. just said, though. Um, she used the word holistic, which is, is that word says so much. Um, good planning is holistic, meaning that um, all different uh, facets and in particular input from all different people and groups is considered in a planning process so that you end up with a good result. Uh, planning land use and transportation together is really essential and, and, and it hasn't always been done that way. I think there's a greater deal of attention paid to it today, thank goodness, because you end up with investments that don't work, um, that are, are, are inefficient and, and with wasted money um, without doing it that way. So holistic is critically important and that means planning land use and transportation together with input from the communities, particularly the people in the community, also the cities and, and their staff as well, and, and the transit agencies. Um, I do think there's a lot of collaboration that happens here uh, in the Denver region where I work, which is very fortunate. The Regional Transportation District, which is the transit provider that I work for, um, it covers an eight county region. So that makes it a little easier to begin with because we cover such a, such a large area and we do connect with the cities in that area and work together uh, very well. It, that's, that's been a very, a very good thing. Um, but we also do work with our state Department of Transportation too, which has a rail division, uh, uh, Colorado Department of Transportation, and we work with cities. So um, that's something I think we do do well and it's really critical to get a good result. Yeah. Uh, and I know here in Massachusetts, we're reworking our regional transit authorities. Uh, each one of the 15 of them is, is really different. Uh, it's really hard to, uh, you know, set standards for each one of them because they're so different, but they're so vital, uh, especially for people who need transit. Uh, and they come at a low cost, which brings us to the uh, subject of the cost of transit. And uh, Tracy, I know you and I have been talking about a very important decision that the MBTA has made with regard to uh, extending a pilot program they began by offering commuter rail service from Lynn into Boston at the same cost as a subway fare. This is a substantial difference in cost, $2.40 versus the commuter rail cost of $6.50. So 
Uh, this is being done to encourage ridership to shift from the crowded blue line or bus routes into Boston to the less used, at least temporarily uh, less used commuter rail service from Lynn. Tracy, talk about the importance of this decision and uh, what it means in terms of transit oriented development in the future, if they should extend these types of programs. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, this is a, is a great move by the MBTA to kind of do this, to kind of expand uh, this pilot, which was originally one week, uh, which doesn't provide enough time, I think, to kind of see, you know, what kind of positive impacts could be made on uh, making an extension of a fare reduction like that. You know, of course, you know, at MassInc, we did uh, uh, put out a report around fare equity, talking about the need to kind of lower commuter rail fares, because we have, especially off peak, you know, during, outside of that kind of time where the nine to Five workers are um, most likely to be kind of taking the train to kind of get into or out of Boston. Um, a lot of those trains are running mostly empty. And so we have an opportunity to actually fill those seats. And the one way to do that is they kind of uh, demonstrate it with the weekend fares by doing that flat $10 weekend pass is that, you know, people want to have that freedom to be able to ride the train whenever it's reliable and fast and they can actually get to where they need to go. They will ride the train in lieu of taking their cars because of the convenience and the cost. And so, you know, bringing that cost down, we know that in our gateway cities, in the uh, uh, TOD areas around the stations, and most of them, uh, that's actually the hardest uh, uh, hit area as far as uh, kind of economic uh, uh, challenges. You have, you know, where, that's where you have a lot of uh, lower income uh, communities um, living. You have a lot of um, uh, subsidized affordable housing in the areas around the rail stations when there is, has been development done in those areas. And so a lot of the folks who live closest to the train, it could just hop on, can't afford to do so. And so kind of doing that, using that pilot, I mean, there's been a lot of development that's happened around the Lynn station. There's been a lot of uh, affordable housing that's been developed around that station. And there's also been a lot of commercial development. And so to have additional folks coming into the community, actually foot traffic, there's an amazing coffee shop right there by the train station that I love going to. You know, I know that they would be very happy to have more people dropping in, grabbing a sandwich. By the way, the sandwiches are awesome too. You know, so yeah, going in, grabbing a sandwich, grabbing a cup of coffee, that's going to help us actually revitalize our economy and help us recover from COVID-19, is if we're actually um, piloting these kinds of uh, fare reductions on more lines, not just for getting people into Boston, but for example, getting people from Haverhill to Lawrence, you know, if we could actually do some sort of major fare reduction there to kind of get people using the train, mm -hmm. as opposed to driving, that's going to really help uh, not only uh, with uh, looking at you know what the possibilities are for land use and improve ridership but also for economic development and recovery from this uh, recession that we're currently in. There's certainly uh, calls for in some cases make the tea free um, but definitely there's a push on to lower the cost particularly of commuter rail and other forms of mass transit with people saying look you're never going to get the ticket revenue anyway to uh, pay for all of the cost and is this a government responsibility to supply public transit for people. Susan, what's the uh, mood out in Denver in terms of the cost of mass transit? Um, it, it, often we hear that our fares are too high. And, um, and, 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 and I'm afraid you're going to ask me to quote some, and I'm not going to be good at that if I need to. <laughs> but um, but I, I do know that um, in the grand scheme of things that our fares do tend to be high. And, uh, and that, that's, that's, a, that's, a real, that's a real problem. Um, there is, I have heard the call for um, free transit as well, and uh, it would be wonderful to be able to provide that. I think what's going to have to happen for that to happen is for there to be an overall recognition of the need for it and, and the value of it um, in order to fund it. I mean, it is a public good. It's a public service. We fund other public services as the public, so uh, perhaps one day we'll reach that point. Um, but yes, we definitely do hear that here as well, that make, make transit, make transit free. And there are a number of reasons to consider that. Yeah. And actually to piggyback on that, Bob, um, you know, it's, um, as we talk about equity, you know, and we talk about some of the historic, you know, uh, disparities that we have in our communities, you know, as we think about transit, transit has 
the capacity to kind of undo some of those historic wrongs, some of the decisions that were made to only provide certain services or to put in a highway infrastructure to, to divide communities of color from other communities. I mean, I think about, you know, I said I-35 uh, through downtown Austin. I remember being in Austin, Texas, and just it, they deliberately put in that highway to separate the black community from downtown Austin. You know, and one of the ways that we could actually kind of help to rectify some of those uh, past uh, very poor decisions that have led to our current inequities is to think about transit as a way to kind of ameliorate that, to actually provide transit that actually helps to kind of bridge some of those physical separations that poor planning in the past has uh, uh, have exacerbated some of the discrimination and uh, systemic racism in our uh, communities of using transit as a tool for providing more mobility and access. So whenever you think about transit as, as a tool for equity, as opposed to a system that has to pencil out, it does really change your perspective as to how transit can be used and what the costs truly are. Because if you're able to lower some of the other costs, like public health benefits, social services, because people can't get access to opportunities or get access to resources that they need to grow and develop themselves and, and their communities. If you can actually leverage transit in that way, then the cost uh, conversation really shifts whenever you take into consideration all of the costs, not just the cost of operations. Yeah. Well, I think the MBTA is at least embarking on taking a look at its entire fare structure. And uh, we're going to be hear more, hearing more about that in the months ahead. Uh, Sean raises an interesting question. Since transit and development issues by their nature cross jurisdictional boundaries, what is the best way to establish a regional decision-making process for planning and development? Um, do we have a, an adequate governance system now to consider the regional implications of everything we're talking about? Tracy, Susan. I, I have some thoughts on that. I mean, I, I think certainly if you have someone who can be a regional convener, that's a, that's a place to start. You know, like I said, the regional transportation district that I work for, we're regional. So that gives us opportunities in that way uh, to, to be that focal point and to be the ones who invite all the others to the table. But often uh, metropolitan planning organizations, the MPOs, uh, they're regional entities. Uh, these are the groups, uh, the COGS, Council of Governments, uh, that federal dollars tend to flow through because of their, and I assume that is true in Massachusetts as, as, as it is in Colorado, I'm not certain of it, but, uh, but they're a regional entity that again, has the ability to act as that convener and know who the players are, and know who's, who they need to have at the table uh, to have all the voices that, that, are, that need to be heard and the input that's needed. And I think that one thing that's different here, Bob, than what's happening in Colorado, because as someone who used to live in Washington State as well as in South Carolina, county government there is very strong. And in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. that's not the case. So I think that, you know, the state here uh, dismantled county government, was it back in the 80s, early 90s? And so as a result, you have 351 municipalities, each who are kind of um, charged with doing their own thing. And when you have a community of 2,000, cited next to a community of 40,000, mm -hmm. And they're expected to actually do, to kind of like take on the exact same responsibilities. It's a much, very much a challenge. And so we do have uh, regional planning organizations as well as our MPOs across the state. And a lot of them have different capacities. So for example, you know, we've been um, talking to different communities in our gateway cities about uh, TOD planning. And some of them have the staff, you know, in-house to kind of do the planning work. Others are actually working with their uh, regional planning commissions or regional planning agencies to do that work. But some of the regional planning agencies and the MPOs just don't have the capacity to do that work. And so how do we fill that gap? Uh, there needs to be a little bit more kind of thought about those regional organizations and how they can act as conveners here in Massachusetts and the role that they can play, but also making sure that uh, more communities kind of really see the value and the benefit of actually uh, coordinating and collaborating. Because right now, you know, if a local community doesn't want to participate, they just kind of back away. And the same is true of regional transit agencies. So, I mean, you know, if a majority of folks in a community decide, hey, we don't want to have bus service in our in our town or city, well, actually just prim probably primarily just in our town, um, then, you know, the folks who are actually transit reliant or, or just can't get around with a car and don't have access to services right in their town, they really can't, they're stranded. I hear a lot of that from folks who li are mm -hmm. actually living, you know, in Berkshire yeah. County and actually in some of the other counties yeah. out in Western Mass. So, you know, mm -hmm. I think that regionalism is huge, huge, but, you know, we have to be willing to do that here in an area with a lot of local control. 
That brings us to our fourth and final poll question. Uh, do you think that your city or town is doing a good job making places, services, and jobs accessible to everyone? We uh, ask you to check in there at our poll question number four. We want to thank the people who uh, we have so many questions that have been emailed to us and uh, put in our question and answer box. We're trying to sort through them and get to the ones that we think uh, will be most relevant uh, for us to discuss here. But uh, one of the questions, uh, Angie says, can you talk about the potential to use private intercity bus services to bridge gaps between RTA service areas and gateway cities to make the connections that aren't served or underserved by commuter rail? Well, I, I want to jump in and say that um, in some ways that's actually kind of happening. We do have trans TMAs that are actually are kind of provide mm -hmm. that service, but we also have um, some private entities that are actually contracting at least on paratransit services and as well as on some of these micro transit uh, pilots that are working with uh, our transit agents, regional transit agencies to kind of provide some of the service. Uh, I think that um, with more uh, funding with more um, authority that's our regional transit agencies can do more of this kind of coordination kind of almost like a public private partnership of working with private entities i you know we featured at um our gateway city innovation awards uh uh ceremony last year actually an entrepreneur who did um help fitchburg uh, in, in fitchburg the uh, uh mart transit authority there um actually with their paratransit technology help them with the dispatching of paratransit services and in the process helped hundreds of private entrepreneurs kind of start transportation related com companies to provide more than 6 million rides across the state for people who need to get help to health and human services. Um, if we could actually kind of expand that kind of model into kind of filling the gaps and where the regional transit authorities are working with the private sector because we have a lot of innovation out there. There's a lot of technology and there's also there are also a lot of people who want to be able to provide these services. It not only kind of helps improve transit, it also helps improve regional mobility, it helps improve economic development when people have pathways to kind of actually be more engaged in their community and get people to where they need to go. So I would like to kind of see that model kind of expanded more to, into not just paratransit services, but to general uh, uh, transit services. Okay, we have the results of our poll. Only 5% said you think your city or town is doing a good job making places, services, and jobs accessible to everyone. Yes, but could be doing better, 40%. No, we need to improve 52%. And 3% uh, never thought about it, but they're probably thinking about it now. Uh, during, during the COVID-19 uh, uh, shutdown, we've heard a lot about street space and making better use of treat, street space, uh, getting away from the car-centric culture that dominates much of urban life. Now, we know a lot of that traffic is coming back, but both Tracy and Susan, can you comment on what we can do to make walking and biking and perhaps even scootering safer and a viable means of getting around our cities? Well, certainly, um, I, I, I do think that, that that definitely has happened in Denver as well with the, uh, with the uh, fewer cars and in some days seeming like almost no cars on the street. Um, the streets became a whole opportunity for public use. And in fact, the city and county of Denver actually ended up closing a couple of streets so that people could use those streets for um, more, more safe bicycle access and, and walking and, and recreational activities uh, during the time that, that they had to shelter and people had to shelter in place. Um, I think there has been a real concerted effort here overall, at least in, in the city and county of Denver, to ensure that there are bike lanes, uh, to ensure that pedestrian areas are sufficient, to actually prioritize pedestrians and bicycles over cars uh, by the timing and traffic signals um, and things like that that provide safety devices for pedestrians when they need to, to, to cross the road. So I think, I think there is a trend toward that, at least in, in, in some areas. And I think it, it's those technical tools, uh, putting those in place and actually making pedestrians and bikes the priority and scooters, as you said, Bob, um, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, over cars. And uh, Tracy yeah. and Boston, of course, we don't have the room that they have in Denver. So, it, right. yeah. you know, do we have enough space to do what needs to be done? 
Well, you know, it's kind of funny, you know, even before COVID-19, you know, we were still working out of our office downtown. I would love like going out to lunch, you know, during the lunch hour, you know, in the financial district and seeing how many people are just walking in the street because the sidewalks are so narrow, you know, and Mm -hmm. cars are trying to dodge around folks, you know, and I mean, there are some places where it naturally makes sense, I think, to kind of close down streets. But one of the things that has come up uh, pretty frequently um, is about the equity concerns around this. How do we make sure that we're doing so equitably? Because I think uh, one of the criticisms of the whole open streets movement right now is that a lot of the decisions as to where streets are being open are in communities where um, typically um, they're typically more more gentrified areas and they're actually serving uh, communities uh, that are typically more populated by uh, higher income and also um, fewer communities of color. And so, you know, thinking about, you know, which streets are we opening and why is is, is a huge uh, mm-hmm. conversation we need to have. And I think it also in our gateway cities where people are more dependent on cars, we need to really think about, you know, which streets make sense there. Um, but I think that, you know, um, we we have a, a really great opportunity, but as we kind of look through this equity lens, uh, we also need to think about what was the safety of the streets like before COVID-19? Because there's not just, you know, uh, safety of pedestrians and people walking down the street uh, from, you know, car traffic. There are, there are also just some places where just walking down the streets uh, uh, because of poor lighting or because of a lot of vacant lots and um places, you know, a lot of abandoned vacant buildings and lots and things like that, you know, people just didn't necessarily feel safe, as well as, you know, there is the sidewalk infrastructure that needs to be improved. And for those who aren't 30 and fit, you know, for, you know, making sure that there are places where people can stop and rest, or places where it's wide enough for families to actually push um, a stroller down the street, you know, and the sidewalks. But, you know, we don't want to completely close off streets and, and, you know, across the city, not necessarily, not yet, until we have better transit service. Mm-hmm. I mean, but we have to have the transit <clears throat> services. We have to have the shuttle services to help people get around if we are going to close down compl- uh, no, entire districts. Um, but we need to be very uh, thoughtful as to how we make those decisions and make sure we're asking people in their communities what makes sense for them. Mm-hmm. If we start there, I think that it, it'll, it, it then starts to make sense as opposed to us cherry picking, well, this is a cool looking place. Let's go, just go ahead and close down this street so that the businesses here can actually spread right. out. You know, So yeah, we need yeah, to think more about that. It's interesting how the pandemic, though, has really opened this up uh, for debate. And um, believe it or not, we have already come to the end of our hour. As many of you can tell, we're just getting started with a lot of these issues. It goes on and on and on. I do want to let people know that uh, we will attempt to answer all your questions. They have been saved. And uh, we will be able to reply to all of you. And um, I just want to thank Susan for getting up a little early this morning out there in Denver and joining us. It's really great to have your perspective uh, from, uh, from somewhere else to, to, to compare to what we're doing. And Tracy, for people who want to uh, read the report and learn more about this, direct them to where they can go. Yes, well, we included in the chat a place where you can go to read the report. It's at, uh, just, I'll just say it out loud, it's massinc.org forward slash research forward slash equity dash report. So I invite everyone to uh, uh, take a look, download the report. And we also have a URL, uh, which we're going to share in the chat as well, uh, for folks to go and participate in what we're calling our TTOD challenge. So we're asking people to kind of go out into their communities um, and uh, take some photos of places where you think uh, there's some space that could be um, transformed. And to, in order to kind of help your community respond to uh, COVID-19, as I mentioned, especially in some of our gateway cities, is crowding, not density, that is the real challenge. And people just don't have enough fresh air and open space because we know that being outside does help uh, eliminate uh, some of the ability for the, the the virus to be able to transmit itself. You know, some pl- communities need more open space or, you know, in order for businesses to reopen, you know, they have very small uh Uh, spaces and they need to have some sidewalk or street space to be able to kind of show their wares so that they can actually uh, recover from this uh, uh, from the pandemic and not just Mm -hmm. restaurants but actual you know some of our essential businesses could actually use some of that street space Um, so if you can go take a look um, use the url take the challenge send us your photos and how you would actually uh, uh, reimagine that space in your communities and we'll share that in our next uh next conversation 
That's right. And uh, Tracy has dubbed these the Todd Talks. <laughs> yes. Not the TED Talks, <laughs> no. but the Todd Talks. <laughs> and yeah. uh, you may see us, see us at WGBH getting more involved in, in what is a really important issue for all of us to consider. And we have an opportunity now to really, I think, make some changes and, and do some good things. So thank you right. so much, Susan. And uh, thank you so much, Tracy, and thank all thank of you. you. Please take our survey, by the way, and sign up for that Mass Inc. Challenge. But uh, I'm Bob C. I've been uh, really honored to host this event this morning, and I hope you have gotten something out of it as I have. Thanks to all of you.